Thank you, Cynthia. Welcome everyone, as everyone is selecting their language choice there. I will start us off by just saying thank you for coming tonight to our webinar about SB 24159, the phase out and cleanup bill. We're so excited to have you here tonight um, to learn more about this bill and how we can have our voices heard on this important issue. So I'll give you a quick um, welcome and overview of the webinar. And we will also um, begin with a land acknowledgement. So to give you an overview of the webinar, we will start with a big picture about the need for um, phasing out fracking and cleaning up fracking wells. We'll go into deeper depth about what the bill does exactly, both the phase out portion and the cleanup portion. We'll have um, experts, our two uh, subject matter experts to speak on the bill, Heidi Leithwood and Kate Merlin who will also help us with some responses to FAQs and understanding um, sort of counterpoints to some of the opposition talking points that may be out there. Then we'll have some good time for questions and answers. So um, please keep your questions close and ready to go when we get to the question and answer session portion of tonight. Then we'll look at the overview of the legislative path forward for this landmark bill, this historic piece of proposed legislation, and um, end with some ways of how we can have our voices heard and how we can get involved um, with supporting this exciting bill. So that's the webinar until about 7 p.m. And then we'll transition into um, an optional time to get some support and instruction on how to write a letter to the editor to support this bill, which is such an important way to have your voice heard and support this. So please stick around afterward um, from 7 to 7.30 for that LTE writing session that we'll be doing. And is everybody so able to see my screen with the slide? I can see it. Yep. Okay. Good. Great. All right. So with that overview complete, I will um, hand it back to Heidi for our land acknowledgement. Thanks, Bobby. We'd like to acknowledge with deep, deep respect that the lands upon which we gather today are the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Ute, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Apache, Comanche, Osage, and Kiowa nations and peoples, along with 48 other tribes that have lived and traveled here in the past and present. We respect the indigenous stewards of this land, past, present, and future. We remember the painful history of genocide and forced removal under settler colonialism, and we commit ourselves to dismantling the structures that perpetuate this legacy and the status quo. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken, May they reaffirm the ties of all indigenous peoples of over 48 historic tribes to these unceded lands we call Colorado. Thank you, Heidi. So as we get into different portions of this evening, I'll ask each of the speakers, presenters to briefly introduce themselves um, when we get to their section. So I'll start off now um, with sort of the big picture overview of the need to phase out fracking. So I'll introduce myself. I'm Bobby Mooney, and I am the campaign coordinator um, with 350 Colorado working on the Beyond Oil and Gas campaign. And so I've got the job to tell you about tonight all of the um, reasons why we need to phase out fracking in Colorado. Um, if you're someone who has been learning and working on this for a long time, you know that that's not an easy thing to do in just a couple of minutes. But I'm going to give it a try. So here's some big strokes. First of all, pollution from oil and gas production has impacted the health of Coloradans for decades. Right. This is a long term ongoing problem. Oil and gas companies have drilled over 100,000 oil and gas wells in Colorado, releasing massive amounts of air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution and climate pollution. And these companies are often not held responsible for cleaning up the pollution they have caused. And currently there are over 290,000 people in Colorado in our state that live within a half a mile of oil and gas facilities. 
and the scientifically documented health risks of living this close to oil and gas wells include respiratory problems, neurological symptoms, gastrointestinal problems, and increased cancer risk. Pollution from fossil fuels is a known environmental justice issue. And that's the case here in Colorado as well. For instance, according to a report by Protete in Colorado, oil and gas wells are more densely packed in high Latino counties with more than twice as many wells per square mile. The risk to drinking water wells is double in high Latino counties with an average of, of 9.3 oil and gas wells in the seven mile radius around drinking wells compared to 5.4 well oil and gas wells in the 10 mile radius around drinking wells in other counties. Further oil and gas drilling, fracking and production are the number one source in Colorado of air pollution causing our severe ozone pollution problem. Four million people in Colorado are at risk from ground level ozone at levels known to cause cardiovascular and respiratory emergencies and scar tissue in healthy lung tissue. And finally, the oil and gas industry is Colorado's top climate polluter, higher even than transportation and electric power generation. Coloradans are already suffering from health and other impacts of climate change with low income communities and people of color at greater risk from these climate impacts driven by pollution from oil and gas. So to align with the global scientific consensus calling for the immediate phase out of new fossil fuel development in order to avoid climate change worst case scenarios, it is imperative that we stop adding fuel to the fire, right? We stop the relentless expansion of oil and gas extraction in Colorado because oil and gas extraction pollutes at every step of the process, from the drilling, to the fracking, to the production, and even afterwards, right? And that's another important piece we're gonna to get to tonight, right, Kate? Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Kate to talk about the other important part of why this bill is needed. Thank you so much, Bobby, um, and thank you, 350, for hosting this. And thank you, Heidi, for making me a slide because I didn't make any slides today. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the need for cleanup, which uh, exists independently of phase out. So um, cleanup is something that's going on right now. Um, oil and gas production peaked in Colorado in about 2019 and has been declining, we know it's going to decline further. The Orphan Well program has exploded recently and is only going to continue to grow um, very quickly in the coming years, it is expected. Um, total cleanup costs in the state are projected to be as, as high as $7 billion. Um, and last year, the state spent $10 million on cleanup, 95% of which came from taxpayers. Only 5% of that came from um, industry through the enterprise fund and bond collection. So uh, what this means is that the state is not able to clean up these wells as fast as it needs to, to protect public health and safety, um, to stop methane from leaking into the air, to stop uh, water and oil from spilling into farmlands and vulnerable communities. And um, the people who are profiting are the wealthy oil companies who are playing a game of hot potato with these dead and dying wells. They, they take these dead and dying wells and they transfer them to smaller operators who are designed to go bankrupt. Um, and that relieves them of the liability of having to clean up after themselves. This loophole has existed for a very long time. Uh, we've been trying to, I forgot to do the total introduction. I just jumped right in. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm, I'm Kate Merlin. I'm a staff attorney with Wild Earth Guardians. And um, I and Wild Earth Guardians and others have all been trying to draw attention to this problem for a really long time. Um, it's sort of unbelievable how long we have been, even since uh, SB 19181 was still being created. Uh, we testified about the need for additional financial assurances um, 
There's a great new report from Carbon Tracker about the failure of our, failure of our financial assurances rulemaking um, to really make any kind of positive uh, momentum on this on this problem. Um, we need to close this loophole. We need to stop operators from playing this game of hot potato. And the way that we do that is by holding prior operators accountable um, when wells become orphaned. If a well becomes orphaned, anyone who owned that well needs to be held potentially liable. Um, and I'm going to talk about the bill specific a little bit more later. Um, so I'll just say that um, this is a really common problem. We're seeing, actually, we saw a lawsuit filed this week against an operator called HRM. Um, and yeah, the, <laughs> this goes on all the time. It's, uh, it's, it, to protect public health and safety, we really need to close this loophole. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Kate. I think you're up next, Heidi. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And thank you, Kate. The slide was a joint effort between me and Jan. So, <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to say as an overview that this bill that has just been introduced is, uh, meant to address both of those problems and the, the brave sponsors you can see listed on this slide, senators, Takas Lewis and Priola, and then representatives Basenecker and Marvin when it gets to the house. And so this bill will require phasing out of new oil and gas permits by 2030. We'll get into more specifics later, prioritizes reductions in disproportionately impacted communities and enacts the kind of reform that Kate was talking about the necessity for. And I'm gonna go ahead and go on and start with the details on the, the side of the bill that phases out the new permits. So this reduction would start in 2028. And um, the reason for that is, well, some results of that is that, that, that it gives time for communities to manage that transition. It also is helping us um, ensure that the bill right now won't be costing money. Um, so it'll be easier to get it passed if we start the phase out a little later, but it still does require no new permits by 2030. And the permits that it covers are every single permit that has to do with approval of a new well and also approvals for reopening, deepening, and recompleting old wells. So anything that increases um, production of hydrocarbons, oil and gas. Once, the, um, once this bill passes, it will require any new permit to say that um, the permit won't be valid anymore if the well isn't drilled by the end of 2032. So they might, it, this is to ensure that operators can't stockpile a whole bunch of wells and a whole bunch of permits and then just drill them later over decades. Uh, the bill also does uh, require a follow-up to a study that you may have heard of that got passed last year. Last year, some of us that are supporting this bill also championed a bill that created a study on workforce transition, how oil and gas workers can be supported to transition to other industries. And, and this bill requires a follow-up on that and also allows for plenty of time to plan for that. <clears throat> I'll pass it back to Kate to describe some specifics of the cleanup portion. Thanks, Heidi. Um, you guys are playing hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> so I talked a little bit about the necessity uh, for having this type of financial reform to hold prior owners accountable. Um, and I'll, I'll just go through a little bit um, of, of how that actually works in the bill. So right now in Colorado law, the state is the default um, payer for all of these uh, facilities. So that basically means that under current state law, if the state cannot prove um, which operator is responsible for what percent of a, an, uh, a situation that needs to be cleaned up, and also 
cannot prove or it cannot prove that the conduct giving rise to the liability was against the law, the regulations or the permit at the time that it happened, then the state assumes the liability for all of that. It does not have the ability to hold uh, operators what's known as joint and severally liable. Uh, joint and several liability basically means that um, any one responsible party can be held liable for the entire um, cost. And then it's up to those potentially responsible parties to go figure it out amongst themselves um, who is going to reimburse um, each other under the contracts that they have. So what we're trying to do here is remove the prohibition on joint and several liability so that the state only has to find one payer um, and we've, we're removing the responsibility for the state to prove um, percentage of, of fault with that provision as well. Um, so the state just basically needs to say, we, we as a state had to clean this up for you. Here's the bill, you pay it, and then you figure out which uh, company amongst yourself uh, is responsible for what percentage. Um, we also have removed the requirement for the state to prove that the conduct was illegal at the time that it occurred. A lot of times, especially uh, with historic spills, we don't know uh, who exactly uh, did it or whether the conduct uh, was against the rules at the time that it happened. Um, so again, this just makes sure that the state doesn't end up being the default um, in, in all of these situations. And then lastly, uh, there's some cleanup language. Last year, the legislature expanded the jurisdiction of the commission and made them responsible not only for oil and gas, but also geothermal and carbon capture and sequestration. And so this uh, liability provision um, is, is being cleaned up to include those new technologies as well. Um, because those were not um, included when they expanded the jurisdiction of the commission. Um, I think I've explained all of it. Mineral rights owners will not be affected. Landowners will not be affected. This is purely the operators who owned and profited uh, from operating that well. Great. Thanks, Kate. Um, so there have been a lot of questions coming up from people and from potential opposition. And so we wanted to address a couple of these questions just very briefly. And I also wanna let you know that there is a much more extensive document of FAQs that's gonna be available to you in a toolkit. But um, first of all, uh, this is not a ban. It will end new permits. It will phase out these new permits to um, stop the expansion of oil and gas drilling into neighborhoods, but it won't do anything to mandate any reduction in production. So all of the nearly 50,000 active wells will continue to produce and wells typically can produce for 40 years. So once when the fracking boom started in 2008, that means a lot of those wells permitted in like 2010, 2011, those will still be um, producing in 2050. And then the wells that are permitted all the way up to the time of the um, phase out of the new permits in 2030, those will still can still be producing in 2070. So this is definitely not a ban and production will be able to continue, no problem. And another thing people have been saying or wondering is, will this cause us to, to become dependent on oil and gas from other states? You'll hear this as a big talking point of the opposition. And this is so ludicrous because right now we produce 3.8 times more natural gas than we use, and this is an average since 2017, and we produce 1.7 times more oil than we use in state. So right now we are producing far more than we need and that is getting exported and the companies are making the profits while we get the pollution. Um, so as I said, those wells will be able to continue producing. Meanwhile, 
global demand that's going to be going down. Colorado demand for oil and gas is going to be going down. It actually peaked in 2019 and 2020 and started to go down already. And as we know, our state policies are leading us down the path of decarbonization and less and less demand on oil and gas. Um, the next question here is whether this violates property rights by saying that they can no longer keep drilling every inch of oil and gas producing land in the state. Um, that is also not true. You, you might hear people wondering if it is a taking and this gets into a little bit more detail in our FAQ sheet, but other states have done fracking bans and there have not been successful lawsuits there. Um, we, the, the ECMC has denied some permits already and um, things have not materialized there. As I think um, one of us mentioned already, there's been a uh, new law, SB 180, 181, back in 2019 that specifically states that not taking that oil and gas out of the ground is not considered a waste. Um, the mineral rights, uh, Kate has already mentioned from the cleanup side of the bill. And then I think Kate, you're the one to talk about whether some of those cleanup um, liability provisions might be attacked as unconstitutional. Sure. Thanks Heidi. Uh, yeah, so uh, cleanup has not received a lot of the same intense um, uh, attacks that the phase out portion of the bill has received. Um, and so, some of this is a little hard to know how they're going to challenge us if and when they ever get around to challenging us on the cleanup portion of this bill. Um, you know, frankly, I think uh, it's hard for them to argue against having to clean up their own messes. So maybe. But one of the things that they might claim is that the retroactivity of this bill is um, an unconstitutional retrospective application. It's a little bit nuanced in Colorado. There's a difference between retroactive legislation, which um, is legislation that applies to conduct um, that occurred prior to the enactment of the uh, legislation, um, and unconstitutional retrospective um, uh, legislation. So uh, it, it my constitutional primer is about five pages long. I'll give you the too long, didn't read version, which is simply to say that, uh, no, we don't think that this is a problem. This type of financial shifting of burdens uh, is commonplace. It has been commonplace in American law since the 1950s and 60s. Um, it's very common in environmental law in particular um, and has been upheld in many different contexts. Um, Jan, I see your hand up. I think you want to jump in on this. I just want to tell everybody to make it easy and say the word super fund <laughs> because this is why we passed prior owner liability is mm -hmm. because super fund sites would sell off a contaminated site, to some other poor schmuck who'd get stuck paying all the uh, costs. And so the federal government passed a law, I think in the 80s, um, Kate, and uh, so the, the easiest yeah, answer is it's a super funds thing. It's a specific yeah, environment. Super funds a good example, although it's interesting. Super fund actually doesn't explicitly say retroactive in it, but the courts have consistently uh, uh, held that that does apply retroactively. And really, what it was, it wasn't just that the poor schmucks were were buying the you know the contaminated property. It's you know, that what happens is, is that becomes the government's burden. And these toxic sites were costing the government or threatening to cost the government hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, just as the orphan well crisis is threatening to do today. And so just like uh, Superfund, um, but, but in fact, the case law goes back earlier than that. Um, we are saying you do not have a right to create a, con a contract between you and your buddy, which says that you don't have to pay, right? You don't get to create a contract which says, hey, this is all going to go to the government to clean up, okay? That's just not something that's going to stand. The public interest is just going to simply override that. 
Um, we need these polluters to pay because they profited um, for decades and took billions of dollars uh, from these wells. And they are trying to skip out on the bill at the end. And uh, we are working very hard to make sure that doesn't happen um, because these liabilities are going to last long, long into the future. Many of them need to be not only extensively cleaned up, but also often replugged after the fact. Um, sorry, I, I went on a bit of a tear there. Um, that's the that's the main challenge that we see um, coming down against uh, uh, against the cleanup portion. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end if anybody thinks of any others. Yeah, thanks, Kate. We'll definitely have time for questions. And then before we move on from this slide and get to the questions, I just want to bring up some other concerns that people might have thought of. What about revenue to local governments and the state from oil and gas? And what about the oil and gas workers and communities? So it is really, really important to consider this. There are some of our communities in the state that are much more heavily dependent on oil and gas. Um, put in context statewide, all of the revenue from the oil and gas operations, including severance tax and all the property taxes that they pay to local governments, is really only 1.2% of the entire revenue taken in by the state and local governments. So that's a very, very, very small percentage. And we do, um, it is very important to help the communities that are much more dependent on it to get through this, but there is time to plan. And um, we and our other partners will be making sure that we are working on legislation for that, for that planning. Um, same thing for the worker tr workforce transition. And um, this bill does give time for that. And it also gives certainty to those communities rather than being at the mercy of the volatile industry and what's going to happen in the global transition just relying on market forces is, is going to be very chaotic. So this really gives certainty and um, lets everybody know that they do need to plan and there is time for that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide, which is just simply what questions do you all have about these bills? And I think maybe Bobby, is it okay for you to kind of moderate this and look for people's raised yeah. hands or look for the questions in the chat and pass them on to us? Yes, that sounds good. We've got the experts here, Heidi and Kate, and also Jan Rose. Um, we can ask questions about the bill, how it works, um, anything at all like that. So please feel free to raise your hand, as Heidi mentioned, or you can type a question into the chat, and I'll do my best to make sure we're touching on all that we can here tonight and following up afterward if we need to. So I already see one question in the chat, I believe. It's not a question, but a statement. All right, now looking to hands raised, I see um, one hand, Diane. You can just go ahead and unmute and speak there your question. Okay. Thank you. My question has to do with the land, the soil. So if I'm a farmer, I own this farm, but I don't own the mineral rights and they have fracking wells on my farm, what happens to the land? Is the land still usable? Is the soil wrecked by all this? What, what happens? Um, I don't know who is the best one to take this, but oftentimes the soil does get damaged and needs to be what's called remediated. Um, they, they are supposed to be cleaning up spills. Oh, Jan, Jan, you're the one to correctly answer this question. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated question because these days operators are trained to keep the topsoil. And so if you can um, spread the original topsoil on top of the damage you have done with your drilling, then um, then we can call it good because it can revegetate what was there before. But the older the well is, the less likely they kept the topsoil. 
And topsoil is irreplaceable. You literally cannot drag in fill dirt and expect it to return the land to its original condition. Um, so it's a little bit of a nuanced question, but it's an entirely legitimate question because if the top set soil isn't there, the cost to remediate the site is just enormous. I mean, we have single wells who have done so much damage that they've cost the state more than a half a million dollars. Um, that's in Broomfield. In Windsor, there was a well that did so much damage that it cost $1.1 million to reclaim the surrounding area. Um, so a lot of damage can be done if the operator um, didn't care about the damage done when he built the pad and built the wells and then abandoned the wells. And I hope that's helpful. Thank you. And I do believe that that's what this lawsuit is about. Um, some agricultural landowners that, is that right, Kate? The lawsuit? Um... Yeah, the lawsuit that was just filed um, by Earthrise is a lawsuit, it's a class action lawsuit um, involving an operator known as HRM. HRM is really interesting. They dissolved themselves as, as an entity every couple of years and reformed. So there's HRM, HRM2, HRM3. I think they got all the way up to HRM4. Basically, same owner, same everybody, same website, but they just, I don't know, these corporations, right? Um, so yes, they just... Um, uh, transferred a bunch of their dead and dying wells to an even worse operator known as Painted Pegasus. Um, Painted Pegasus went into the orphan well program a couple of years ago um, at, at quite a large cost to the taxpayers. Um, and basically the, um, the landowners are claiming fraud. They're saying that HRM is basically committing fraud on the state and against them as uh, as landowners who have to deal with these facilities um, on their land um, instead of cleaning them up. Um, that's the gist of it, as I understand the case. Thank you, Kate. Great questions. Keep them coming. I see a hand up from Fred. Hello, um, my name is Fred Malo, 350 Warring Park. <laughs> Anyway, um, Alan Best in Big Pivots said uh, Senator Steve Feinberg's going to kill this bill by sending it to the uh, Agriculture and Natural Resources uh, Committee, which will uh, no doubt kill it or gut it, uh, one or the other, uh, whereas it would have a better chance uh, going to the uh, Transportation and Energy Committee. Um, I wonder what uh, I plan to send my letter to the editor to Feinberg, uh, asking him not to do that. And um, I wonder what other kind of pressure we can uh, apply on him to save the bill from getting uh, uh, defeated in committee. So I'm going to leap in there and say, <laughs> I want to leap in there. All right, you go first. We don't want to leap in. But, um, <laughs> It would be, you're on the Western Slope, right? Are you in Dylan Roberts's district? District eight? Yes. Yeah, he is the person to put pressure on. It already is assigned to the Ag Committee and you are, I know, I've seen your letters to the editor and op-eds and you're a great writer. The more of those that you can submit over there on the Western Slope, the better. And we'll definitely connect with you out of, out of this meeting um, to Thanks. try to put some pressure over there. Sorry, Kate. Thank you, Heidi. I'll, send, I'll send you a copy. That's Great question. Okay. I know. Oh, go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. Yeah, we'll get into, in just a few minutes, we have a little time set to kind of delve into the path forward, the legislative path forward. Um, and this is already touching on it, which is great. And I think it's something that we're all very curious about and passionate about. So thanks for raising it. I see another hand up from Harmony. Hi, thanks for this great presentation and everyone's work on this. What happens if they don't pay the fine? 
So this isn't a fine. Um, this is actually holding them responsible for the cost of cleanup. Um, and yeah, uh, what happens when the attorney general sues you and you don't pay? I guess Donald Trump might be about to find out. <sighs> totally. Okay. And then... Yeah, I, I and just because I did, when I worked in oil and gas, would hear people brag all the time about playing the big red sea game. And this is definitely a known thing that they do to get out of holding their obligations and things like that, but never been able to like hold them down to being accountable and kind of like what you said, I don't know. There's just so many parts of that. And then my second question becomes, is there strategically these two concepts being placed together versus two separate bills what is the thought on that well they're to they're together um so so it, it doesn't is, really it is matter what it is. okay you know, the the bill is the bill and the committee it's been assigned to is the committee it's to assign it's assigned to and so we got to deal with what we got to deal with uh, so we're assigned to Senate Ag, and I know there's a lot of scuttlebutt going around about how oil and gas bills don't get assigned to Ag, but in fact, I ran an analysis, and if a bill is introduced in the Senate and it's an oil and gas bill, 90% of the time it gets assigned to Ag. So this is not some sort of complicated plot you know, to kill the bill. Um is the other half of Senate Ag is natural resources. That's the full committee name. And obviously oil and gas is a natural resource. So most oil and gas bills get assigned to Ag unless the sponsor specifically asked for it to be assigned elsewhere or leadership thinks it's such a terrible bill that they assign it to what's known as state affairs, which has a nickname of uh, of the kill committee, <laughs> which occasionally oil and gas bills are so bad, they go to the kill committee. So, um, so, you know, this isn't breaking the mold. Um, uh, it's common for oil and gas bills to go to ag. What's also true about Senate ag is that it's a one vote committee. Uh, there are seven members, four Dems, three Republicans, and so if we lose one Dem, the bill is lost. Uh, and that's just a fact. Um, and um, so uh, so therefore, it's a harder battle to fight in the Senate Ag. But if we make it through Senate Ag, we have a smoother path through the rest of the Senate. And I obviously can't speak for the House as a whole, but um, this bill, 159, came up in a, a Boulder County legislative call, uh, town hall. And, you know, granted it's Boulder and they're liberal and all that neat stuff, but we have a supermajority in the House and every one of the representatives said they would vote for this bill if it were to cross their desk, if we can make it to the House. So, you know, um, goal number one is clear the Senate where we don't have a supermajority. Um, and, um, and you know, fallback goal is that we don't win and we try again. I mean, lots of bills have taken years. Um, but I do want to raise a point that you are going to hear. And that's the issue of mineral rights owners, because the mineral rights owners are kicking up a giant fuss because... If we don't allow perpetual drilling, there goes their investment. And, you know, I, I want to say that investing in mineral rights is number one, kind of creepy. <laughs> you know? number, number two, it's quite speculative because since 2019, we said, if you leave minerals behind, uh, it's not considered waste. So you are not required to go and get those minerals that you leave behind because they're inconvenient for the frackers. So, so that, again, uh, uh, mineral rights owners have had five years to adjust to the reality of a speculative investment. 
And owning mineral rights is no different than owning penny stocks or owning, you know, any other sort of stock or bond investment. It's um, its value is completely dependent on the whims of the market. Um, and we are not explicitly removing your opportunity to get a return on your mineral rights investment. What we're doing is giving you eight years to find someone who is willing to bet against the planet and bet against the people and bet mm -hmm. against the pollution and take those rights from you um, and let you sell them. But there will all over the planet be minerals left that we don't drill for because there is a slogan, it's called keep it in the ground and it exists for a reason. So it's not anything we need to be ashamed of or embarrassed by. It's a critically important thing about saving this planet is we've got to leave these minerals undeveloped because we don't want the last monetary transaction on this dead planet to be some idiot buying a gallon of gas. Okay, so sorry, get a little carried away, but I'm kind of passionate about here, this here. the ground stuff. Okay. Here, here, Jana. I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see. We um we're gonna talk a little bit more about the path forward for this bill. And Jan, I think you were already, you know, sharing some of that. Is there more you'd like to talk about regarding the path ahead? Um, well, I mean, I kind of gave it away a little bit. Uh, you know, it's gonna go to Senate Ag and Natural Resources. If your senator is on that committee, regardless of their party affiliation, please send them an email and tell them how you feel about this bill. It may not change their mind, but it is important. It is important that they hear from their constituents, regardless of their position. Um, and if we don't survive this committee, the vote ratio is crucially important to the bill's prospects next year. So if we lose four to three, that sends a super strong message for next year that we came that close. It's like for those of you who were around in 2018 when we ran the ballot initiative for Prop 112, the 2,500 foot setback, we got so many votes for Prop 112 that it forced Polis to do a 2,000 foot setback. And we got more votes than the Republican gubernatorial candidate, which sent a super strong message. So if we lose four to three, that is a victory in many respects. If we lose six to one, that sends a different message. So um, don't be shy if your senator is on Senate Ag and Natural Resources, please do let them know how you feel. Now, if it does survive that hearing, then it might go to Senate Appropriations because they might argue that this bill will cost the state of Colorado tax revenue lost severance tax revenue a decade from now, lost property tax revenue a decade from now. In theory, appropriations is only supposed to care about things that will impact the budget in the next three years. But the oil and gas industry doesn't fight fair. So I would expect them to try to influence the fiscal impact of this bill and claim it's going to cost the state of Colorado a fortune. Um, and so it might go to appropriations and appropriations doesn't take testimony. Um, so the only thing that we can do is submit written comments to Senate appropriations. And our comments ought to be that the cleanup provisions of the bill offset the mm -hmm. lost revenue because the cleanup provisions allow us to go after prior owners, which saves the state, you know, millions of dollars, potentially billions of dollars. So if you're going to play future speculative 
losses, you also ought to play future speculative gains. Um, so that's one way to approach it. Um, they could send it to Senate finance and Senate finance only takes fiscal testimony. So repeat of what I just said, you, know, you, you can talk about the money. You can't talk about the climate. You can't talk about public health. You can't talk about the real reasons why this is a critical bill, but you can talk about how much this industry costs the people of Colorado because it costs way more than it gives back way, way, way more. Um, and so you can, if it goes to finance, say this will save the state a ton of money in uh, cleanup costs and in public health costs and lost productivity and increased jobs because more businesses will move here because it's a wonderful place to live and we'll still have snow and so we'll still have a ski industry <laughs> and that's billions of dollars of revenue, yada, yada, yada. So that's our next step if we can clear Senate Ag. And if we clear Senate Ag and then we clear the monetary committees, then it will go to the Senate floor and it will get, you know, it will get an uproar. But we do have a many vote majority in the Senate. And so if we can clear the two committees, um, we will be reaching out to y'all again saying talk to every Senate not just the ones on Senate Ag, but every senator, because we need to get this bill to the House. Indeed. And if we can get this bill in the House, we stand a good chance of passing this bill. Um, so I, I yeah. want you to have a good understanding of the path ahead and the obstacles that face us. Um, but it, these are not uncommon obstacles. They're not unusual obstacles. Many bills have fought them before. We need to fight them too. This is an important bill. The, in, the International Energy Agency has said, stop drilling for new projects. The UN has said, stop drilling for new projects. This bill doesn't say stop drilling for new projects until 2032. How hot's it gonna be by 2032? Come on, people. So, Absolutely. you know, to me, this is a no-brainer. And, and I'm done. You're so right, Jan. And I think part of how we tackle those obstacles is through people power. It takes each of us contributing what we can from where we are. So I know we have just a few more minutes left in this one hour webinar. And I really wanna share with you all some of the ways that you can um, have your voice heard and take action in support of this bill. As I mentioned earlier, for those who can stick around a little later, we're going to do an optional LTE writing session from 7 to 7.30 and can have some more time uh, for questions in there if we need to. So the first thing I want to share with you of how to help this bill this week is very timely is to participate in Climate Lobby Day on Friday, March 1st from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the state capitol. I've just put an RSVP link in the chat. Um, where you can join us on Friday. And along with Climate Lobby Day on Friday, we will be holding a press event for the phase out and cleanup bill. Um, and we'll gather at 11.15 a.m. in the west foyer of the state capitol. And really the more the merrier. We wanna show a lot of support, a lot of excitement around this bill. So please come out and join us if you are able to um, come to the state capitol on Friday. The other big important um, way you can help Bobby, out. Bobby, if I can just interrupt for a sec and say the bill is not officially the phase out and cleanup bill. The bill is officially SB 24159. So it's like 181. It's like 1261. It's important that we call it by its name, which is 159. Um, and so it would be great if you called it 159 because if anybody looks up phase out and clean up, they're not going to find the bill. <laughs> it's our it's our nickname for it. So thanks. Good Sorry. point. Thank you, Jan. That is such an important point. The next um, action you can take is contact your legislators. And I've linked into the chat a toolkit that can help you with everything you need to contact your legislator, especially if you are a constituent of um, those Senate members that are in the Ag and Re Natural Resources Committee. 
Also in that toolkit is some um, tips and example posts that you can use to spread the word on social media. Social media is an important way to get the message out. Um, so use those examples that are in the toolkit to spread the word on social media and to friends and family in every channel that you're able to. Next, I wanna mention um, testifying in the first committee hearing for this bill. I'm gonna put in the chat a sign up link where you can indicate your interest in potentially testifying on behalf of this bill. And what that really can mean is just two or three minute statement um, in the first committee hearing in person, or you can do it by Zoom and just come out and voice your support for the bill. So if you're interested, complete that form and we'll connect and give you everything you need regarding the details and information you need to make a powerful statement on behalf of 159. And finally, I want to mention writing, writing, writing. Writing a letter to the editor is such a powerful way to get the word out. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to hang around for another 30 minutes to talk a little bit more about writing a letter to the editor, giving you some tips and tricks and information. Um, so if you're interested, please hang around for that. And even if you can't do it tonight, you can certainly work on it in your own time. And I've got a link for you on that as well, a toolkit specifically for writing a letter to the editor. So those are the um, action items I've got for you for tonight. Have I missed anything, gang? Anything to add? I think you covered everything, Bobby. Did you say post? I think you said posting on social media. Yes. Yeah. And you can do that by creating your own posts using some of the samples that are in the toolkit or um, retweeting, reposting, resharing um, posts that you see online coming from any of the organizations supporting the bill, including 350 Colorado and Wild Earth Guardians and many others. Okay, so that's um, what we've got in terms of action items. I want to encourage you all to reach out with any questions or ideas um, to further amplify our people power support of this bill. I see one more hand up from Micah. Hey, I just wanted to also mention if people know people mm -hmm. in the ag districts, especially um, Senator Dylan Roberts, District 8, uh, since he's the chair of that committee, um, I think it's going to be more important than we realize to reach out to people one to one. Anybody knows folks in that area. And um, that's a lot of the ski districts. And I know the ski um, industry is helping right now to put together a letter to be delivered on Friday. So um, that's a huge economic engine that's being harmed badly by the um, climate crisis and also the lack of water. So anyway, but I think those one-to-one -one contacts that we can all make right now too could be really more influential than we think. So if everybody could think about folks in, in the, that district, uh, it's Vail, it's Glenwood Springs, um, uh, who else knows a few of those areas to contact friends in those places and ask them to take action too. It could really help. Yeah, and sorry, Jan, I see your hand, but I just wanna say also, Cleve Simpson, Dem uh, Republican down in the Alamosa area. If anyone knows people down there, I'm happy to buddy up with them to try to go in and talk to him in person or in a Zoom meeting because he cares a lot about water. His bills are for water and he does not have a bad environmental voting record. And I think he it would be great for his constituents to also hear from him. And sorry, Jan, I'll pass it to you. Uh, no, that's fine because yes, he does. And, you know, he's been an environmental champion as many farmers and ranchers are environmental champions. Um, but I just wanted to say that the Democratic members of Senate Ag and Natural Resources are Jesse Danielson, who's vice chair of that committee, um, uh, Senator Janice Marchman, who has Weld County in her district. So she really needs to hear, if you're her senator, she really needs to hear that this is a bill you'd like to see her vote yes on because this is a bill 
that's going to have repercussions for her, but she's not up for re-election until 2026. So this is a bill she can afford to take a yes vote on. Um, and then the third uh, member besides um, Danielson and Marchman is uh, Senator Kevin Priola, and he's the co-sponsor of the bill. So he's a definite yes. Uh, so, um, you know, but but they need they need additional support. You know, they need to to get an upswell from their from their constituents that a yes vote is a righteous and good vote. Um, so if any of those are your senators, please do um, tell them to do the right thing for the planet. All right, we're just at the end of our webinar portion of the evening. The, I want to say okay. the vote is March 14th. Scott, I just see your question real fast. It's March 14th. That will be such an important date for everyone. Sign up now. Sign up now. Uh, like I said, there's a, a link in the chat um, to indicate your interest in providing testimony. And if you are curious, not sure, um, go ahead and fill it out because we can talk through it. We can give you everything you need to do it. And you can do it in person or um, virtually like this. So it really can work for anyone. I saw Neil and Diane had their hands up and I don't, I don't you know, want to leave without acknowledging that. Yes. Thanks, Jen. Right, I was well, just yeah. wondering if we have an idea of where the Dems on the committee stand. Obviously, Priola is for it. How about the others? If you were to ask me personally, I would say that they can be persuaded to support. I would say that Marchman is the toughest Dem to get support for because her district is Weld. And so she's going to pay a political price in the short term. But if Marchman was my senator, I remind her she's not up for re-election until 2026. And 2026 is a long way away. And so, you know, do right for the planet and frankly, do right for her constituents. And if Marchman was my senator, I would really focus on the cleanup portion because Weld County has an extraordinarily high number of spills mm -hmm. and orphans. Um, so uh, I and would hit the cleanup mm -hmm. half of the bill harder than the phase out bill if Marchman were my senator. Mm -hmm. And the um, bill has some transition provisions, correct? It follows up on a study that was already put in place last session okay. for transition. Um, I would also say that it's um, it's more that we don't wanna take the democratic senators for granted. Mm -hmm. um, Dylan Roberts is a really tough one because he does have some big oil counties in his district and he's a Democrat, but he's more inclined to vote against it. And he has actually already gone on the record. So he, it's gonna take some per, really big persuasion, but we don't want that to cause us to neglect letting our other Democratic members of the committee know how mm -hmm. much we support this bill. We don't wanna take them for granted at all. And if you have a Republican senator, point out the impacts that climate change has on the agriculture industry. I mean, it has extreme weather impacts. It has drought impacts on an ongoing basis. It has the fact that for every one degree C of, of increased carbon, the nutritional value of their crops goes down, which means they sell for less on the commodities market. Um, and, you know, half of Colorado is already at three degrees Fahrenheit. We, we are one of the fastest climate um, uh, impacted states because of our altitude. So this is already hitting ag. It's already hitting recreation. Um, and and I, I wouldn't just uh, write off the Republican senators. If they're listening to the ag community, they know farmers and ranchers are being hit by climate change. 
farmers and ranchers, they might may not call it climate change. They may call it extreme weather. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> Hey, Jan, are all those wonderful talking points in the LTE toolkit? Heidi? There are a lot of talking points in the LTE toolkit, and we do need, we will be updating that with additional talking points for um, the clean up side of the bill. So we need yeah. to beef it up for that side of the bill, but there's a lot to get started on. In the and and on the climate change part of the bills, I did send a whole bunch of information about how um, how climate change impacts the agriculture industry specifically, not just in floods and droughts, but also in pests. Because y'all might remember that the Ol Olathe sweet corn crop got wiped out by this thing called the corn earworm, which is a direct pest that we didn't used to have to handle because we didn't used to be this hot uh likewise fabulous grasshopper infestation last year that we didn't used to have to handle because we used to have a major spring storm that wiped out a bunch of little baby grasshoppers and so yeah so that you know so um so we're putting together lots of stuff related to that um, but there's plenty of, but those are really for the Republican members of the committee. The Democratic members of the committee already acknowledge climate change is real. It's bad. It's us. And we got to do something. Thank you. It, it, Jan, it would just be, it would be great. Like Dylan Roberts, he's a Democrat. Um, I'm going to send, send some kind of letter to him. Um, I don't know if they already know all the arguments. It just, it seems like throwing it out there to them. So as they're talking to the Republican, maybe this doesn't happen at all, but if he's like very um, a, a proponent of it and he needs to convince the Republicans, I don't know if he's going to, but if he can, giving him in the letter, like, hey, these are the five points of why, you know, if you're in an ag community, you should be 100% behind this. Like, that'd be helpful, too. Well, I appreciate that. And I think Heidi, you know, we haven't been paying much attention to the Republican members of the committee because we've been focused on shoring up the Democratic members. Because if we can get unanimous Democratic support, we pass committee. Um, but if we can't get unanimous Democratic support, then if we could get a single Republican to vote for us, we pass committee. So I think we're, you know, Heidi, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think we're we're putting together ideas for ways to talk to the Republican members of Senate Ag and Natural Resources, not just about this bill, but about all bills that impact climate change. Because what we have to say about the need to phase out oil and gas relates to every bill that addresses uh, climate change in the state, not just this year, but all the years moving forward, including what hasn't been said in this webinar, which is for the last eight months, we've been 1.7 degrees C hotter than normal. So we didn't just blow past 1.5, we blew past 1.6, we're at 1.7. Um, and we're going to stay at 1.7 or maybe even more until around next August if the La Nina kicks in as they think it's going to. And even when that happens, we're likely not going, we're likely to bounce down to 1.5 but we're likely to have already blown the threshold that we thought we had till 2030 to meet. So six years, seven years ahead of schedule. Um, you know, you, you've seen us say later is too late. <laughs> Literally, later is too late. Thanks, Jan. And so I, I see another hand up. I just want to say we're we see a lot of people still here and we're hoping that you're, you all are people that wanna stay with us and get started writing an LTE. 
Um, and so we're gonna take this one last question and then I'm gonna turn it up over to Bobby to start us on our LTE action. And thanks everybody that um, if you have to hop off, we totally understand and we thank you for being here. Um, so uh, Diane Gimber and do you have your hand up? Okay, uh, Diane got her chance to ask a question, so now it's mine. Okay. Um, what can we do to get stories about the negative factors of oil and gas into the TV and radio media? Writing letters to the editor has an effect, but a lot of people don't read anymore. Yeah. And so we need to get small stories about all of the bad things that have to do with oil and gas, like where does the water come from? Where does the water go? Where does the, how about the waste? And on and on, building people's understanding of the peripheral uh, disadvantages of oil and gas. Yeah, definitely. And we definitely need to work on that. Um, Brian dropped a link to his great movie about this. Um, Micah said in the chat that a lot of money is needed for TV and radio. And another thing I can see, I can envision is, um, I don't know who's going to lead this because we're all spread very thin, but a huge campaign of people submitting news tips to all of these TV stations, news tips about it, just average citizens. And when things happen, um, when people are having their own impacts, just like su submitting constant news tips so that they can't ignore it anymore. And I think that's a great point that you make there. Okay. Um, and thanks to Christian for posting maps and analyses. Um, check out his website there that he's put in the chat. And now I'm going to turn it over to, to Bobby to get us started on this LTE action. Thank you, Heidi. Yes, and thanks so much to everyone sticking around to um, participate in this part of our evening. Um, a little bit of a writing session about writing letters to the editor or op-eds. So I shared in um, the chat the link to the toolkit, the letter to the editor toolkit. Um, and I'd like to also share my screen with you while I kind of introduce this toolkit a little bit. Bobby, can you share that one more time? Because I, I think it is. Yes, here, let me grab it from the chat. Okay, it should be the most recent thing in the chat right now. Letter to the editor. SB 24159 letter to the editor toolkit. And that's what we're looking at right now on my screen. So this toolkit is great because it gives some general tips and tricks about writing letters to the editor or, or op-eds and it gives a ton of specific information about 159 and the need to phase out and clean up. Bobby, can I just interrupt real quickly once for the Spanish translation? There is, this will be also available in in, um, Spanish translation. So if you're listening to this interpretation of this webinar, um, please contact us and we will get you the Spanish translation of the LTE toolkit. Thank you, Heidi. So I'll give a, a brief um, overview of the toolkit. We start out with um, some facts like, did you know that the opinion section of the newspaper is one of the most read sections? I didn't know that. Um, so it's inspiring to know like there's a way to really reach people through this and it is free, unlike extremely expensive um, TV and radio ads can be. All right, so some steps on how to do this, how to take action. Step one, use the suggested talking points and all the information that we have in here um, to start crafting your letter, but a really important point is that you put it in your own words, right? So modify what's in this toolkit to um, be authentic to your own voice. And if you'd like some help with that, we are available to help. You can always contact Heidi or myself or others here that have a great experience to share. 
then you want to pick your media outlet, um, preferably something local, something close to home. We do have a list that's linked in the toolkit of Colorado media um, that you can use as you need. Then step three, check back in and see if it's been published, right? Like you submitted in, don't always know that it's going to be published, but you can check out and see if it has been. And if you do get published, please let us know because we'd love to uplift um, your letter. And then step four, of course, find other ways to get involved. So we have, um, you know, all those other action items we share, shared earlier, different ways to get involved. And I'm always happy to speak with um, you one and one and, and brainstorm together and how we can um, build this movement. So then the toolkit has some great general writing tips that are in here, sort of different ways to make your letter more effective, concise, clear. Um, and, and then we get into the background on SB 24159. So we've got the full um, title of the bill that you can see there. Um, just remember 159, that's the most critical point. Thanks, Jan. And then it's some really great basic background information, stuff that you've already heard here tonight, but it's nice to have it sometimes uh, in writing right there. So we've got some great talking points, links to some other documents with more information. There's a link to a fact sheet on oil and gas wells in Colorado general. Some great figures, stats, statistics that you can pull from, sort of talking points to help out with crafting your letter, as well as some really detailed fact sheets on the two portions of the bill. So there's a fact sheet on the phase out portion and a great fact sheet on the cleanup portion. Um, and then if, of course, if you need to learn more, we've got our subject matter experts um, here who can help as well. And then what I found really helpful and Heidi mentioned this earlier uh, is the FAQs on the bill, right? So some of the same questions that Heidi and Kate were walking us through earlier, potential challenges or opposition um, about this bill. Here, you've got some fantastic um, talking points and information to help address some of those concerns and opposition points. And I think, I think at the bottom of the toolkit, that's it, yeah, FAQs round it out. So that's the, the LTE toolkit, everything you need to get started in writing your letter. Um, Heidi, I see your hand up. Oh, that was up from before, but I, I do also want to say that this toolkit will continue to be in development with additional points added for the liability reform and some of those other um, informational points that Jan was mentioning earlier. So as you're continuing to write, if you're particularly interested in that aspect of it, check back with the toolkit tomorrow or the next day. Great, thank you. All right, so we wanted to have a little time, just a few minutes for those who are interested to start wrapping their heads around writing a letter or maybe you already have started writing a letter. Um, there's a little time here for that and some time to ask questions um, of each other and our uh, subject matter experts about writing um, a letter. Do we have any questions, anything coming to mind when you start thinking about crafting your own letter to the editor or op-ed piece. You excited to do it? <laughs> yeah, Fred, thank you, Fred. Thank you. All right. What do you think, Heidi? Anything you want to share about writing a letter to the editor or Jan? Oh, I see Brian's question in the chat. There is a link to the publications in there um, up under 
the initial points. Click here for contact information. And I've highlighted ones that we're particularly wanting to focus in this first phase. Um, I think advice is to really think about your feelings and how you feel about this and sadness, anger, whatever you're feeling, and let that sort of fuel you and um, as you're trying to figure out what to say. So it's really coming from the heart, and then you use the facts to back up um, your reasons for writing this. Fred's gotten a lot of stuff published. Fred, do you have any tips for people? Um, here we go. Oh, Lately, like I haven't been doing so well, but uh, I don't know. I don't like to shotgun them and send them to all different publications because I'd read letters to the editor and uh, I don't like to read the same ones over and over again. So I usually pick out a few key publications like this one on uh, this bill is going to go to the Aspen Daily News and the Colorado Sun and uh, perhaps the, the Denver Post. Uh, just pick out a few key ones and uh, and go with that. And uh, I am very aware that people read letters to the editor. I was uh, a reporter for the Glenwood Post back in the 90s, and I had three or four bylines a day, and nobody knew who I was. Since I've been writing these letters to the editor, I've become famous. Um, people I tell when I am put having petitions, having people sign petitions, first thing I tell them is my name. And a lot of times they say, well, I know you from your letters. I'll sign anything you want. So uh, it, people do read these letters and that's that, that inspires me. Yeah, thanks so much, Fred. And I also want to say, I'm, I just was reminded, I was talking to our member Janice Hallowell, who's such a great communicator and she's a best-selling author um, and a good friend of mine and she was saying you know basically it doesn't need to be a super long letter you can just have several sentences and just short sweet and punchy and um, and that's going to be very effective yeah that's good to know the other thing I've thought of is or I've seen be helpful is, you know, if you have any concern or about writing the letter, or you're nervous, don't know where to start, um, just start, right? Like you can write a letter that no one ever sees and that's fine, but just start getting your thoughts and feelings on the page and working towards um, eventually a letter that you feel like is ready to share uh, for a second set of eyes, like any of the experienced folks on this call or right into pub you know, submission to a publication. Yeah, that's a great point, Bobby. I mean, sometimes I just say to myself, I, I'm just going to write a bad article just so I can get started so that I'm, I'm not trying to be a perfectionist and just getting started is the main thing. And then you re rewrite and rewrite. Definitely. All right, so who's going to do it? Who's writing a letter? I know Fred is on it. Yeah, I'm doing Paul? it. Paul? Yeah. Is, um, is there any one specific most important talking point? I think whichever one you feel the closest to, really, because we need a wide variety of talking points to reach a wide variety of people, really. That's just, that's my personal opinion. I don't know if Bobby or Micah is also on here. You yeah, have other I, I feel like I could write a little short letter to the editor for each talking point. Yeah, definitely. You can uh, send different theme, letters to different media outlets. My theme for my letter was um, 
how this is the next step after SB 181 that, uh, you know, accomplished so much and and this is the ne next step on the on the way to remediating climate change. Yeah, I like that. Just whatever you feel like is most important to you or compelling to you, and you can do it more than once. So yeah, go ahead, write, write one for each talking point um, and see what you know you can get published where. All right, I know we're getting just to the end of our time here. Um, any other thoughts or questions on writing LTEs? What can what can Through Fifty Colorado do to support um, individuals and volunteers in writing? Any ideas or questions? I want to say we do have a network set up here to help you, and so if you write me, I can put you in contact with someone who can actually help you write write it, which is actually Janice. And Paul can help you with your scheduling and like coordinating with other people that are signing up to write the LTEs. So if you're, if you're needing help or wanting to kind of feel like you're part of a team, please email me and, and I'll help you get set up there. <clears throat> I just put into the chat the uh, letter to the editor I sent to the Denver Post yesterday. It's only three sentences, three short sentences, but it uh, makes a point. Yeah, I love that. Yes, yeah, stop drilling, <laughs> right? Stop. I love the way you phrased it there, Paul. And I always think like, just stop adding fuel to the fire, right? Like our house is on fire. We don't need to pour any more oil or gas on the fire. Cool. Okay. Well, I would say good luck with your letters. Keep us posted. Reach out if you have any questions, want any help writing or reviewing your letter. Um, and then let us know if you get published, right? We'd love to um, shout it out, out, you know, spread the word, lift up your letter um, if it's published. So keep us in the loop, please. All right.